Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Physics 30, Atomic Physics, Lesson 4, Atoms, Isotope, and Radiation. Now, there's a lot of background stuff here you should remember, but we have to hit it anyway. So, let's get started. The first thing, the atomic number Z, or Z, is the number of protons in the nucleus. The neutron number N is the number of neutrons in the nucleus. While the mass number A is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. That's Z plus N. The protons and neutrons are called nucleons because they are found in the nucleus. So you might see that term nucleons. Now, getting back here, the mass number is 12. In this case, that is N plus Z. That tells us the isotope, or which version of carbon we're dealing with. And the atomic number, Z, is 6, tells us which element we're dealing with. Okay, and remember, of course, protons and neutrons are here in the nucleus. The electrons are in orbit around or outside. Now, just remember, isotopes. Isotopes are atoms with the same number of protons, that's Z, but different numbers of neutrons, N, and hence the mass number is slightly different. Now, the chemical properties of isotopes are the same, but the physical properties are different. So the isotope name is the name of the element followed by the mass number, for example, carbon-14 or C-14. Right. Now, here, so for example, one isotope of carbon is carbon-14. 14-6 carbon or C-14. Now there's lots and lots, there are hundreds, possibly thousands of isotopes, I can't remember offhand. But for uranium, there's 12 or 15, but three of the common ones are U-238, U-235, and U-239. U-235 is a nice stable one. If you want to make it a nuclear weapon, you start off with some U-238 and you turn it to U-239. Now hydrogen, the most common element in the universe, is mostly 1-1 hydrogen. That it, it has one proton, sorry, the mass number is 1. And the atomic number is one, that is, has one proton. And the nucleus only has one proton in it. Now, deuterium, or heavy hydrogen, has one proton. But it has a mass number of two, which means one proton and one neutron. And tritium, the stuff used in hydrogen bombs, has an atomic number of one, that is one proton, one proton plus what gives three? Two neutrons. So three different isotopes of hydrogen. They all make nice hydrogen gas. It goes pop. Uh, slightly different boiling points, slightly different melting points. But it's when it gets into atomic physics, it gets really weirdly different. Anyway. Now, something you may or may not have talked about before is the strong uh, nuclear force. Now, the strong nuclear force acts on neutrons and protons, but not electrons. Now, this is very short train, very short range, acts between nucleons only a few fecometers apart. Now, go back to your formula sheet. A fecometer is 10 to the minus, sorry, femento-meter. Fico, femento, 10 to the minus 15 of a meter apart. Now, this is much stronger than the electrostatic force. So a proton at the edge of a big nucleus can feel the strong force pulling it in only from particles right next to it. It's very, very short range. About the size of, an, uh, of a nucleus. Or actually, about the size of a proton or neutron. Now, you can feel the electric force pushing out all the way from the other side of the nucleus. So, if you have, so I'm trying to say here, so if you have a proton here in the nucleus, it's attracted the strong nuclear force will pull it in, attracting it to the other uh, new particles right next to it. But the electron out here in orbit will repel it because the electrostatic force acts at a much larger distance. Okay? Very short range, 10 to the minus 15 of a meter is about as far as it works. About the size of the nucleus. Now, something else is the nucleon mass. Now, the mass of a proton is a smidge less than the mass of a neutron when you get down to four significant digits. Yes, the formula sheet talks about mass of proton and neutron. 
Uh, what does it say? Yeah, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. You keep on going, it gets different. Now, what we will often talk about is an atomic mass unit, U. So 1U is 1 12th the mass of carbon 12, and 1U, and note this is not on your formula sheet, oh, it, it is, but they go 1.66. If for homework calculations here, we have to use the more exact value for U, 1.660539 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. No, you do not have to memorize this number. You have to have it written down in your notes or somewhere and be able to use it on your homework. No, I will not ask you on a test to know this number. I will give it to you if you need it, okay? But for the homework calculations today, we have to know this atomic mass unit to the seven digits, all right? Not the 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms on your formula sheet. As I said, bits and pieces you have to know. Now, talking a little bit about radiation, where does it come from? Well, the source of radiation on Earth, radon gas, is over half of it. But the other bits, cosmic radiation from the Earth, internal radiation, yes, you have radiation inside you. Medical x-rays, 11%. Artificial sources, around 4%. Sorry. Sorry. Artificial sources, medical x-rays, nuclear medicine, consumer products, others, about 11%. So, yeah. There's a lot here. Um, be aware of it. Radiation comes from all sorts of places. Now, cosmic radiation. The Earth is constantly bombarded by radiation from outside our solar system. It, inter it interacts in the atmosphere to create secondary radiation that rains down including x-rays, muons, protons, alpha particles, peons, electrons, and neutrinos. All sorts of lovely stuff. Now, of course, you see that. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. My apologies. Uh, the Earth's atmosphere protects us from a lot of this stuff. But this high-energy radiation hits the atoms in the outer atmosphere and that some of that energy is absorbed by the atoms, the, sorry, the electrons jumping up, and then the, remember, because it's not an exact amount of energy they can absorb, they admit or release some of that energy. So yes, fortunately it protects us, it slows down a lot of this, na these nasty particles absorbing energy, and that partially creates the northern lights. Now, solar radiation, including ionizing and non-ionizing, uh, and non-ionizing radiation from the sun. That's uh, stuff given off by the sun that hits the, that some of it, like x-rays and gamma rays, will go through the atmosphere fairly well. Some will be absorbed by this, the uh, atmosphere to protect us. Okay? So yes, there's radiation all around us. It's just mostly small amounts that doesn't hurt us. Now, the terrestrial or earthbound resources, sources, sorry, most materials on Earth contain some radioactive atoms in small quantities. So potassium, calcium, and carbon isotopes are the most common ones we see. And you've all heard of the carbon-14 dating? Yes, that if you have carbon in you, if you're alive, you have carbon in you, so you have some radioactive carbon in you. You also have some radioactive calcium and potassium in your bones. Not a lot, but just enough to make life interesting. Now, as I was saying in that graphic earlier, about 54% of the uh, radiation you're um, exposed to comes from radon, radon-222. Now, radon-222 is produced by the decay of radium-236, which, which is present whenever uranium is found. Since radon is a gas, it's out of uranium-containing soils, and yeah, there's everywhere has uranium-containing soils. So the uranium decays to form radium, which decays to form radon gas, which seeps up into your house. Now there are certain spots in the country where there's quite a bit of radon gas. Uh, around here there's not that much, unfortunately, and it tends to, con since it's heavier than air, tends to congregate in basements. So if you don't live in a basement, you don't worry about it. And even if you do, open the window occasionally. Now, symptoms for exposure to radiation. Now, 
severts is the unit, one of the units used for exposure to radiation. Is Now that has to do with how much radiation you're exposed to and how dangerous it is. In a few minutes we'll talk about alpha, beta, gamma radiation and you realize some is less dangerous than others. Anyway, so 0 0.05 to 0 0.2 severts, no symptoms, potential for cancer, mutation of genetic material. That's well, 0 0.01 I think, 0 0.02 is what we're normally Yes, 0 0.001. So this is beyond, this is more than we're normally exposed to. 0 0.2 to 0 0.5, no noticeable symptoms. Red blood cell count decreases temporarily. You don't notice it, but it does affect you. Now, a 0 0.5 to 1 severt mild, is what we call mild radiation sickness. You'll get headaches, increased risk of infection due to disruption of immunity cells. Temporary male sterility is possible. Temporary sterility for men. Now. One to two severs is what we call light radiation poisoning. That's 10% fatality after 30 days, a mild, moderate nausea, vomiting up to a day. The big thing here is your immune system is depressed, so you get uh, worried about infection and, pro and uh, health problems from that. And temporary, mer st temporary male sterility. You'll see that mentioned a lot because the guys worry about it. It kills the sperm you're carrying, you make more. Now. Two to three severs is severe radiation poisoning. That's 35% fatality after 30 days. Um, LD or how does that go? Lethal or death uh, is 35% after 30 days. Nausea and risk of vomiting. You lose your, all your hair, fatigue, general illness. Now, once again, here the problem is uh, it uh, suppresses your immune system, so something else comes along and kills you. Now, a uh, real problem with this, a uh, permanent female sterility. Uh, here, uh, the ladies, their uh, ovum are destroyed. They don't make new ones. All right. Now, uh, three to four, uh, uh, severe radiation poisoning, if you get three to four severs, it's 50% fatality after 30 days. Uh, you tend to get the, the tissue breaks down. So you get bleeding in the mouth and your kidneys self-destruct. Woohoo! Now, four to six severs, 60% fatal. Uh, yeah, you're really screwed. Infections and internal bleeding, it kills so many cells. And it just gets worse from here. Six to ten severs, acute radiation poisoning, you're 100% fatality after 14 days. You can survive it, of course, serious intense medical care. Your bone marrow is destroyed. You're not making new blood cells. Uh, your your intestines are fried. It's your immune system self-destructs for a month or more. Yeah, you're looking at several years to uh, usually it's cancer or your severe internal bleeding or an infection kills you. Really good hospital care in several years you can recover, ish. Yeah, but there comes a time point where you gotta go. Wow. Anyway. Now, annual radi uh, to cheer you up, the annual radiation doses, Chernobyl, and if you guys watch that Chernobyl uh, video, yeah, you get 10. Five is severs is the annual U.S. occupational dose limit. That's how much you can be exposed to in a year. Underground uranium miners usually get about 1.5 severs a year. You smoke tobacco, you get about two because you're inhaling so much crap into your lungs. Fallout from nuclear weapons that we've tested in the atmosphere, we stopped doing that, thankfully. 0 0.004 uh, severs a year. A nuclear power plant, if you live close to one, you'll get about 0 0.001 severs a year. The t uh, your old-fashioned um, cathode-ray TVs, they told you to stay away from because they cause cancer. Well, they do. Uh, one of the isotope, one of the, is the blue or the green is slightly radioactive. Anyway, 0 0.0005 severs if you, if you stick to the TV surface. Yeah, back away a little bit. And I have to throw this in. 0 0.001 severs is what the radiation dose you get from sleeping with another human. So stay away from other people. Don't let them touch you. Stay far away from them all. All right? Now, getting on to the discovery of this. In 1896, Henry Baccarel, the Jack of Hearts, discovered uranium and other elements emitting invisible rays that could penetrate solid material. 
Becquerel is the SI unit of radioactive decay. That's named after Henry Becquerel. Now, the, okay? now one Becquerel is one disintegration per second. Now, the problem with that, of course, is different radiations are different amount of danger. Anyway, getting to that. Marie and Pierre Curie, the king and queen of hearts, discovered that radio radiation emitted from material depended only on the amount of material, not the chemical state. These elements are said to be radioactive. Now, there was Becquerel. I believe it was Becquerel. Yes, he had some radioactive isotope on a plate, uh, sorry, on a photograph, and that created he, uh, changed the, created an image on the photograph. That's where he realized there was something there. Now, it was Marie and Pierre Curie that realized it didn't matter what you do to the material, you heat it up, cool it down, whatever, mix it with other chemicals. It was... Um, the amount of material, not the chemical state, that affected it. Now, here getting into newish stuff. Nuclei that have isotope stability. Nuclei that have too few neutrons in relation to the number of protons are unstable. In general, the more protons in a nucleus, the more neutrons that are required to make the nucleus stable overcome Coulomb, what we call Coulomb repulsion. Now, for what you have to remember here, for large stable nuclei, we need more neutrons than protons. Okay, so if we look at this here, atomic number Z versus neutron number, if we have the line, purple line is number of neutrons, N equal the number of protons Z, you'll see, no. This here, sorry, I'm going to the wrong color, you can't see that. If we go here, let me see, it's just a nice color you can see. Yes, do white. If we go here, these are the stabilish nuclei. Notice we end up with more neutrons <coughs> than protons holding it together. And notice above 83, uh, atomic number 83, there's no stable nuclei. All the isotopes are radioactive. Okay? Now, I will come back to this graph in a few minutes, but first, I want to talk about radioactive decay. Now, Rutherford, seven of spades, discovered that radioactive thorium emitted gas that was radioactive. An element was changing into another element. Now, the changing of one element to another element is called transmutation. Now, the original nucleus is called the parent nucleide, and the new nucleus is called the daughter nucleide. Now, types of radioactive decay. The first is alpha decay. A large nucleus changed in, into a small nucleus, and a small positive particle is ejected at high speed. So, the particle is called an alpha particle, given the uh, Greek letter alpha, A. It was later determined to be helium-4. So, if we start with radon-222, uh, parent isotope, it will spontaneously decay into a polonium-84, daughter isotope, and give off an alpha particle, 4,2 helium. Now, we will write it like this, 4,2 helium. Oh, wrong color, my apologies. We will write it like this, 4,2 helium. We will also write it as 4,2 alpha particle, but quite often we will just write it as an alpha particle without the 4,2, because we know what it is. And we're lazy. Okay? So, typical question would be, what's the alpha decay of 238 of uranium-92? Right. No, sorry, uranium-238. So, as I said, alpha particle, so it's going to give off a 4,2 helium. What, so what's left? Well, this started off with 92 protons. Two protons ended up in the, al in the uh, helium, so we're down to 90. So, you have to pull out your formula sheet, and you go to the element the periodic table on the second page, you go, what is 90 protons? 90, thorium. Now, if it's given up two protons and two neutrons, it has uh, the mass, the uh, mass number's gone down by four, so it's 234 thorium. Okay? Now, what about 260SG? Uh, I can't remember what that is. Atomic number of 106 is, what is that? Seaborganium. So, it will go for 2 helium. 
106 minus 2 is 104 protons left, which is Rutherfordium. Mm -hmm. And the mass number was 263. Losing 4, that'll be 259. And Rutherfordium is RF. So that's how that goes. Okay? Now, Note the sum of the mass numbers on both sides of the arrows on the arrow must be equal. That's physical principles number eight, conservation of nucleons. And the sum of the atomic numbers on both sides of the arrow must be equal. Physics principles number seven, conservation of charge. So, could I ask what physics principles are you doing? Conservation of nucleons and conservation of charge. Now, in order for alpha decay to occur, the mass of the parent must be greater than the mass of the daughter and alpha product combined. The excess mass is converted into the kinetic energy of the products. What happens here? We'll get a parent nucleus something, and it will, and it will spit off an alpha particle and a daughter nucleus. So, and remember this. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. My apologies. The excess mass is converted to kinetic energy. Now, I will talk about that in a later lesson. But remember, it loses a little bit of mass, and that's converted to energy here. That becomes important. Now, another type of decay is beta negative. Now, this is a neutron decays into a proton and an electron, which is then emitted from the nucleus. Okay? So this beta particle is actually... A fancy way of saying an electron. Now, it sort of makes sense. You take a neutron, you make it a proton positive, it spits off, uh, has to spit off something negative. We call that an electron. Of course, we can't call it an electron. We have to call it a beta negative particle just to sound fancy. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, so reactions like carbon 14 forming nitrogen 14 and a beta negative particle or electron. We're expected to produce beta particles with identical kinetic energies. Now, sometimes a lot of this energy seems to be missing. All right? So they're missing energy here. They're missing mass. So Polly, what kind Polly? Oh, I forget. Anyway, proposed in 1930 that the missing energy and momentum were carried away by a neutral particle with very little mass, called the neutrino, V. Now. Right off the bat, that is a horrible font. It's supposed to be written like that. I just cannot do this on this computer. Anyway, beta decay involves the weak nuclear force which acts on neutron, which acts on electrons and neutrinos. Now, experiments showed that in beta negative decay, anti-neutrinos, the opposite of neutrinos, were emitted. So this goes like this, with a bar above it to show it is an anti-neutrino. <sighs> oh, God help us. No. If you look at your formula sheet, last page, on the right, goes particles, electron, antineutrino, V with a bar above it. Zero charge. So it is mentioned there. I prefer if you write it the slightly fancier font like that, so I know it's a neutrino or an antineutrino. So this is the reaction you have to remember. A neutron makes a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. So... Write the reaction for the beta negative decay of the following isotopes. Now, beta negative, <coughs> excuse me. So what happens here? This makes something. Now, traditionally, we write the beta particle minus one. Ugh, messy, my apologies. And neutrino like that. So what happens here, remember, a neutron turns into a proton. So you start with 27 protons. How many do you end up with? 28. Now, what is the... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. What happens to the mass number? Well, that's the number of protons and neutrons. That doesn't change. Yes, a proton becomes a neutron, but the total stays the same, so it's still 60. Now, more importantly, what has 28 protons? I don't recall offhand, so I'm going to pull out my formula sheet, the periodic table on the second page. 28 protons is nickel. 
So an isotope of cobalt forms an isotope of nickel. Let's do the same thing for thorium. Let's do this in blue. I'm going to make... Actually, you guys see how this goes. Pause the recording, come back, and we'll compare answers, okay? Pause the recording and do it. Okay. Now, when I did it, the thorium turns into an isotope of... 91 is polonium, polonium, brain fat, getting old... Protactium, and the uh, 19 fluorine, fluorine 19 turns into neon 19 during beta negative decay. Now notice I've been harping on beta negative decay. Okay, that means there's a beta positive decay. Now this involves emitting a beta positive particle, same mass as an electron, but positive charge. Sometimes written electron positive just to screw with you. So here, a proton is converted into a neutron. So the proton becomes a neutron, but it had a positive charge, so it's got to spit out that positive charge and a neutrino. So a beta positive particle is the antiparticle of the electron, called the positron. Now, antiparticles are nice. I'll talk about them in a few minutes. But first, let's do a few reactions. So, 11,6 carbon, here a proton becomes a neutron. So, what happens? We start with six protons, we'll end up with five, and what is five? Boron has five protons. Now, what is the mass number? Sorry, no. The mass number on top, number of protons and neutrons, that stays the same. One less proton, but one more neutron. And 0 plus 1 beta particle plus a neutrino, not an antineutrino. All right? So, pause the recording, we'll do the other two, and come back to pair answers, okay? Okay. So, when I did uh, 10 111, I got indium 111, and when I did uh, fluorine 19, I got oxygen 19. So, this is what happens beta positive decay. Notice in science 10, we talked about beta decay. Now it's beta positive, beta negative. What else we talk in science 10? Gamma. Now, gamma, uh, Greek letter G or 0, 0, G showing mass number and atomic number 0, makes it just the uh, energy. A nucleus emits gamma radiation when a nucleon drops from an excited energy level in the nucleus to a lower energy level. Remember, electrons can drop in energy levels. Nucleus, nuclei can do the same thing. Now, the problem is a gamma ray could be emitted along with an alpha or beta particle. So quite often, we'll see, we'll see them in conjunction with other bits. Now, nuclear energy levels are much larger than atomic energy levels. So here's a typical one for an atom jumping from 12 mega electron volts to ground state of zero mega electron volts. When we're getting into mega or millions of electron volts, we're dealing with gamma rays here. Very high energy. Remember the spectrum? It went radio, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma? Yeah, we're getting right to the far end. High, very high energy, very dangerous stuff. Now, when a nucleus emits only a gamma ray, the energy of the nucleus is reduced, but the mass number and the atomic number remain the same. So. It's entirely possible to have it just like that. Gamma ray given off. No change in atomic number, no change in mass number. Okay? But as I said, going back here to these beta negative, beta positive, or beta negative decays, or alpha decays, it's entirely possible to have an it's entirely possible that quite often there's a gamma ray involved also. But since it's a piece of energy, we don't have to always notice it. Unless, of course, we're looking for it, in which case we find it because, you know, it's really dangerous. That's the stuff that causes cancer. Now, decay series. Often a radionucleotide will decay into another radionucleotide, which decays into another radionucleotide. 
that is a radioactive nuclei will decay into another radioactive nuclei, which decays into another radioactive nuclei. Now, this one's this uh, is a little fuzzy, but if you look closely, you see we're starting with the uranium here, and this is atomic num or sorry mass number, which uh, a, and down here is atomic number z. Make this a little smaller so you can see it. View zoom entire page. So we can start with uranium. It'll decay down to thorium. An isotope of thorium will declare to palladium, which will decay to uranium, which decays to another isotope of thorium, which declare decays to an isotope of uranium, sorry, radium, which uh, radon to polonium to lead to bismuth, to another isotope of polonium, to another isotope of lead, to another isotope of business, bismuth, to an another isotope of polonium, and eventually that hits lead 236. That's stable. But everything else is not. And this is a decay series, kind of a long one. So one breaks into another, to another, to another, and eventually it stops. Actually, it's kind of a long one. Now note that you don't mention the I don't mention the times here because some of these are millions of years, but we'll deal with that with half-lives later. Okay? Now, radiation, typical penetration, ionization, and hazard. So alpha particle, helium, travels about 5 centimeters in air, can't penetrate the skin. High ionization potential. It'll take electrons, but it's low hazard. It's gas. Beta travel, beta electrons, sorry, beta radiation, electrons travels 30 to 50 centimeters, little penetration of skin, moderate danger of ionization, and the hazard is still quite low. It's an electric shock, a small electric shock. Now, gamma is the scary one. Travels great distances, penetrates the entire body, not likely to cause ionization, but it, it very hazardous. It's the right wavelength to damage molecules or nucleus in molecules. So, and this is a nice schematic, shows you the relative dangers. Alpha particles will be stopped by your skin. Beta particles might go through your, might go through your hand, but definitely be stopped by a piece of aluminum foil. Gamma rays and X-rays will go through your skin, your hand, aluminum, be stopped by lead. Neutrons will go through everything, be stopped by some concrete. So remember this when we're talking about various decays uh, when we talk about radioactive decay in the next couple lessons. All right? Now, one last little thing. When you have a radiation source and a magnetic field, what have you got? You've got charged particles, or some particles, moving in a magnetic field. So, alpha, sorry, gamma particles have no charge and no mass. They go straight through. What will happen to an alpha particle? Well, go remember, <clears throat> sorry, alpha particle, what's the force on a charged particle going through a magnetic field? Go to your left hand rule, then you realize no, an alpha particle is positive, so you use your right hand rule instead of your left hand rule. Mr. Sutton's out to get you. Oh, no, he's not, he's just pointing at things. So, direction of the magnetic field is coming out straight towards you. The charged alpha, partic sorry, alpha particles going straight, so which way is your thumb pointing? Alpha particle will go like that. And I'm going to put the plus two charge on it just to emphasize it. Now, we also have beta positive charges, so they will curl in the same direction, but what's the difference between an, a beta positive particle and an alpha particle? Besides the fact that beta positive is a charged electron, it's like 2,000 times smaller mass, so it will have a much smaller radius. And where will a regular electron or regular beta particle go? It'll go like that, curve in the opposite direction. So we can look at charged particles going through a magnetic field and go, oh, we can tell what they are based on 
the radius of curvature, like a mass spectrometer. Or at the very least, we can say can, we can compare the masses. Say one is heavier than the other. We can also talk about the charges on them. All right. Now that's quite a bit to uh, summarize. So I'm going to stop here. I want you to review this. If you've got questions, ask me in class tomorrow. Good luck.